Welcome to Micro College. This week on the podcast, we are honored and excited to have as our guest, Chris Barlow, who is the Director of Programs at the High Mountain Institute, which is based in Leadville, Colorado. Um, we're speaking with Chris. Um, it happens to be here. Uh, it's going to go out to the public during the month of October, um, which is the, uh, the the gap year exploration month. Um, and I think this is really appropriate. I think, um, you know, I, as I've become familiar with the gap year world uh, as a both as a high school counselor and as a and now as a as a person leading a, a gap year program, I really look up to High Mountain Institute as one of the premier kind of players in this field, really representing um, some of the highest quality, especially in outdoor kind of experiences and uh, you know integrating the intellectual and the practical and uh, yeah, just really representing uh, what this kind of experience can be like. So thank you for joining us, Chris. Thank you. It's quite yeah. a pleasure. So Chris Barlow uh, hails from Tennessee, and he has held a myriad of roles at HMI dating back to 2005, when he worked as a Spanish apprentice and English teacher. After a number of years working in traditional classrooms and a range of outdoor programs, Chris returned to co-found the HMI GAP in 2014 with his partner, Becca. In addition to his work overseeing GAP, summer term, and other short programs, Chris enjoys spending his free time in the great outdoors, climbing, running and camping with Becca and his two children. Um, um, yeah, so here, you know, that's that's uh, that's your biography in a nutshell. Um, but here on the podcast, we like to start our conversations, really ground them in uh, people's experiences during the during their young adulthood, the time that some of our students are, are coming, uh, are working with us. So Chris, I'm wondering if you could uh, think back to when you were 18, 19, 20 years old, um, where were you? What were the big influences on your life? And, uh, and and how has that shaped where you've gone since then? Yeah, it's you know, this is interesting. I, I try to put myself back as in my my 18 year olds, you know, 18 year old ver, the 18 year old version of me um, a lot when I think about how we structure our programming, how we try to empathize with our students. Um, and you know, I think there were a few features of my life back then that were um, driving me the most. Um, you know, I certainly, I, I went to a, 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 grew up in a pretty rural area, um, went to a public high school that um, was, uh, was a complicated place, I think, culturally. Um, a lot of students were not college bound at that point. Um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a place that uh, put a really strong emphasis on intellectualism, um, really on education. And I think there were some folks there, but I, I think that the community was pretty complicated. So I think being an intellectual, being somebody who came from a family who really valued a life of the mind, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, but in the context of a community that didn't live out those values as much, um, you know, I think, for example, you know, we it's the University of Tennessee, like the, the Vols, like that, you know, it was like football country, um, yeah. which I, I'm not criticizing by any, any, mean, any means, but it certainly, that was a pr bigger priority than, you know, the academic side of, of high school and college. Um, and so, yeah, so I grew up by parents who were, you know, definitely intellectuals. Um, and so I think for me, both that piece of being uh, really academically motivated and intellectual, intellectually motivated, and being in a community that wasn't that way significantly, I think was pretty important to me, um, pretty formative. Um, and as well, I, you know, I grew up also in a rural area where I could just spend so much time outdoors. I, as a kid, I would just be gone for hours, tromping through the woods, splashing in creeks, um, you know, building trails, you know, doing kind of just like you know, ridiculous thing in the woods, basically. And um, somewhere along the way, I got I, I got into rock climbing um, in a very accidental or coincidental way. Um, but by high school, that was certainly the thing that really, um, really lit my fire. Um, and so those two pieces played on each other in, in both positive and some, you know, uh, contraindicating sort of ways as well. Um, so, you know, to me, when I looked forward from high school, um, that was, th those two threads were both sort of the, the intellectual, but also being a bit of like a, I want to be different. I want to do it my own way. I'm not going to fit in those two pieces. 
as well as the outdoors, um, which to me, you know, my mom loves to joke about this. Uh, when we were looking about, they were thinking about colleges, I um, basically picked, I got a map of the United States and I circled about five places that basically had good rock climbing. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to co go to college in these places. Like, this is it. These are <laughs> and she thought that was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I actually think that there's some wisdom in that. I mean, I'm not trying to, it was completely accidental. You know, even a blind squirrel catches a nut or every once in a while. Um, <laughs> but so I, uh, you know, to me, I was able, that was the way to unify these two things that felt really important to me. And so, um, yeah, so ended up at Colorado College, um, which, you know, great satisfied. Rock climbing. Yeah, great rock climbing, a great kind of mountain community, you know, definitely a big focus of that school, a big draw, as well as, you know, a wonderful, um, rich intellectual experience. Um, and so I got, I got to have both, which I think is a pretty great, great thing. And what was cool about that, actually, I think to kind of tie this story all together, was that I went to Colorado College and all of a sudden I wasn't the, the kind of weirdo who like did these outdoor stuff and who was like in like kind of nerdy. I, um, I was like one of the cool kids. And that was very uncomfortable for me in this weird way of like, oh, like I do all the things that are like people were drawn to and people were excited about. Um, and so I kind of had to readjust. I was like, oh, like it's a little bit different now. Um, I can, it's okay to feel like I belong in this community. It's okay to, um, you know, have a, a larger friend group and things like that. So, um, so that was a, a cool, it was a cool experience for me of um, finding my place, I think, um, in a way that felt comfortable. And, um, and I think that is, is a piece that has really, un I think to some degree, unintentionally become a professional focus of mine of, of being able to bring people from all over the place together and have a few core ideas or core things that have drawn them that we can leverage um, to, uh, to build community in, in these you know, small, very small immersive environments. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> boy. As a high school counselor of many years, I really want to endorse that method of, of school selection. Um, maybe it's not rock climbing for you. Maybe it's, uh, you know, if you have any high school seniors out there listening, um, maybe it's the beach, maybe it's theater, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the food culture, whatever it is in a place. But, you know, if you can identify places where there, there's something that really will will feed you in whatever way that is, um, you can build something off of that. And in, in the United States, we are blessed with a lot of interesting colleges and of different sizes and dimensions. And uh, often enough, you can find just the place where you can have an experience like that, so. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I mean, I was, it occurs to me that, you know, there's, I think the, in one way, the college offerings now for students are incredible. I mean, there are such a diversity of, of opportunities. There's so many different ways that we are thinking about higher education. And I think that's a really positive thing, but it's also a bit of an embarrassment of riches. Of, and I think it can be really challenging for um, your given, you know, sophomore, junior, senior in, in high school of, wow, this is such a complex world to, to even think about where my place is in that. And so in some ways, there's no harm in sort of anchoring yourself to something really specific that that you know will carry you through that whole experience. That that is like sort of an interesting like one of my other, uh, I think, educational hypotheses. This idea of like an obsession or that thing that lights your fire. And I think that that is certainly something that drew, that drew me to the gap world as a, as a very intentional outcome is to help folks think about like what is this. You know, outside of professional, your professional life, outside of academics, what is this thing that will get you out of bed in the morning? And how does that work into the fabric of your life? Um, and that's a, I, I love that question. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I think uh, differently from many of the people we've spoken to on this podcast, um, you are, you know, you have a leadership role, core role at an organization that that's, you know, has an older history than your own biography, right? So can you, can you take us back, um, can you share a little bit about the backstory of, of High Mountain Institute and where does it come from? Yeah, so the High Mountain Institute was founded in the mid-90s by Molly and Christopher Barnes. Um, it, you know, at some point, I think they might be great folks to talk to as well. Um, I don't want to tell their story too much for them, but, you know, uh, what they shared with me and my, my memory of talking with them was that they had both a, a sort of a disparate background in both outdoor education, sort of in the Knowles 
um, outward bound, that world, um, as well as in um, more traditional independent um, college preparatory education. And so their, I think their theory was let's combine those. That was sort of the, the, the driving concept is we wanna do both. And that is really what they created um, with the High Mountain Institute was originally a high school semester. Um, so it's sort of along the lines of a study abroad semester, but it, you know, here in Colorado. Um, so a study abroad semester. And, you know, so the idea was um, traditional rigorous college preparatory academics with um, extensive backpacking, like wilderness based trips. And so, um, you know, I think at that point, you know, back in the late 90s, I think that what, what was really innovative and, and wild about that was this idea of we're going to have a um, a really in-depth um, literature discussion, for example, while on a backpacking trip. You know, it's, it's sort of the we're going to read we're going to read Edward Abbey, you know, in Canyonlands, yeah. um, which was a, I think was really cool, really compelling for students. Um, and it was all sort of in this idea of of the community focus. And so, um, you know, one of the sort of found it, you know, or, uh, you know, mottos of H might be well is simple and means rich and ends. And so I think, you know, students are living in um, off the grid cabins. They are chopping their own wood. They are doing they do chores. They cook meals for each other. And a lot of these things still exist. You know, 25 years later, we're still doing a lot of these core elements of what HMI is all about. Um, we're still doing long expeditions, we're still doing rigorous academics, or or in the gap since rigorous intellectual engagement, a little bit different than a traditional classroom. Um, and yeah, so I think that was really the this the original idea of the High Mountain Institute. And um, you know, when I joined, the semester was still the main sort of the flagship program of the school. The high school um, semester. The high school semester, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um and you know i think in the time that i've been a part of hmi we've done a lot of of brainstorming and you know a lot of creativity around how else to live out this you know this mission of integrating the, you know the the outdoors uh intellectual engagement and you know leadership and community um and, and with this idea that we you know we want we want students to be resilient engaged, you know, thoughtful, engaged citizens of the world. You know, we want them to go out and, and impact others in positive ways. And we do that through this integration of these three elements, so. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, could you repeat your, your the motto you said there? Make the, me suit the, suit the means the, to-, to Oh, make, simple and means, rich in ends. Simple and means, rich in ends. That's beautiful, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I think that it still is, we kind of, valued a lot of our decisions you know, and it's not it's sort of just a motto that we have around the school it's kind of like a cultural thing for us it's not formal in any way um but i you know i think we when in doubt we want to try to simplify what we do and um let you know less is often more yeah so this this uh you know this desire to to bring together the you know the intellectual the the academic the kind of the the kind of classroom topics with these experiential and you know, outdoor experiences also shows up in your biography. So, and I think it is, it's, um, you know, as we, we talk about what is a micro college and we've been exploring that over the last year and a half or so on this podcast. And, you know, the, the idea of that kind of integration, the kind of the head, heart and hands, the, you know, the intellectual, the practical, um, you know, the world of nature and also indeed the social, the leadership and community building is also something that you talk about. Um, so I, I wonder if you, you can, you can expound on that a bit more. What does, um, what does, you know, reading a work of literature in the wilderness bring to that discussion that is, uh, is not present in a classroom and also vice versa. What is reading literature bring to the to the wilderness experience rather than just rock climbing and you know and uh and doing the technical kind of things that are a part of that mm -hmm. think about that i think i've got a couple of ideas i guess um i think it, it, there's sort of the most obvious one to me which is um i guess that you know we're not randomly picking literature we're picking literature that is directly related to the places that we go um, you know, HMI is a very place-based educational focus as well. Um, so, 
I think that as we know, you know, I mean, I don't want to diminish the, the, the you know, human capacity of imagination. <laughs> and it's really helpful to be in the landscape or a similar landscape to what we're, what we're doing. Um, you know, I mean, things as simple as learning, learning geology while walking through the bottom of a canyon where you can see the layers of the rock. And I think the students, it, it, it sort of captures all of our different, you know, diverse teaching and diverse learning styles in, in, in just, you, know, you can just walk the canyon and learn. It's really pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, so I think similarly with the idea of, you know, reading a story that's based in a place similar, it, just, it, it allows us to connect that in a way that um, I don't think a classroom offers. Um, I think more importantly though, it's about the community of people that are engaging in the process. Um, I think that we develop habits of how we interact with each other when you know, expeditionary learning, you know, and a, a, a backpacking expedition, you know, we, call, we use the word expeditions, which, you know, we're just talking about a backpacking trip. Mm -hmm. um, it brings the interdependence of the community to a, a very immediate um, timescale. Yeah. Um, where we really rely on each other and there's there's uh you know there's no escape you know you don't have another friend group you can go to when something's not right you're like there are 15 of us here right now and between the 15 of us we have all that we need but without all 15 of us we don't have what we need um and there's there's nowhere else to go <laughs> and so i think that um that I think that you know, good classroom teaching can accomplish a similar amount of of interdependence and a kind of relational learning, and we just have the benefit of, of a structure that sort of demands it, and we don't have to curate it, we don't have to design it. It's sort of in, inherent in that in that experience. And so then, when our students sit down to have a, a literary discussion, for example, um, there's already some community norms that are, have been established by by the expedition, by the by the, the wilderness element of the program. Um, and I think that can be really powerful. I think the other thing that we really strive to do is to, you know, use, we, you know, we talk a lot about leadership, we talk a lot about communication, we talk a lot about what, you know, what a supportive affirming community looks like. And one of the things I really value about HMI is that we really want to live that stuff out. And so, just because we're having a literary conversation, not a talk about our community health, we're still going to live out those values. We're still going to be good leaders. We're still going to um, use effective communication. So I, I think what I appreciate about about the school is that we really try to um, reinforce these these things that we think are just inherently effective. They, 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 you know, they're they're good for building community, um, and they apply in all of these situations. So. Yeah. Yeah, that that community building function of of the of the expedition of the camping trip or a canoe trip. I was just I just came back a couple of weeks ago from a week long canoe trip with our new group of students and this is really nothing like it for building building of a group and uh you know and and going more quickly to those deeper levels of conversation that are not strictly about building community but are deep learning and and you know life purpose developing. So it's 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 really is something that I'm I'm excited to see more and more people, young people and, and older people getting the chance to do as these programs grow and expand. So that's amazing. Um yeah, so you you mentioned um so you in your biography, you know, you um you're one of the co-founders of the the GAP program um at HMI. Um which um, could you say a minute, what does that look like today? What are the scope of these programs and, uh, and, and what are sort of the activities that, that people are doing in them? Yeah, so we have uh, a few different semester models. All of our GAP programs are full semester, 80 day semesters. Um, so we, you know, rather than a high school semester, which is, you know, it kind of goes like late August to mid December, then late January to um, early or mid May, our, our gap semesters are a little bit shorter. They're kind of tied closer to a college um, college semester. Um, <clears throat> and they're a little bit different. You know, our high school semesters are over one, one semester. They do three different backpacking trips spread out mm -hmm. over those 17 weeks. Um, our gap semesters are basically, they're field-based. Um, so, um, you know, our students arrive in a few days. Um, and they will be camping the first night they're here. Um, they'll start a backpacking trip. 
um, in a you know, few days after arrival. And really, you know, of the 80 days they're here, they're they're sleeping in a in a in a bed probably 10 nights total. So it's really a field-based program. Um, we have a few different uh, course flavors for I think for lack of a better term. So you mm -hmm. know we have one that's a very rock climbing focused course. So um, those students are really spending a lot of time learning all the skills of rock climbing. Um, we have another course that is more backpacking focused. So they're really uh, cultivating their skill in backpacking. They're doing longer, um, longer trips deeper into the wilderness. And then the third course is a little bit of a hybrid of the two. Mm -hmm. um, with a few other, it, it's a little more of a sampler course where they get to backpack, they do a river trip, um, in the spring they'll go skiing. Um, so they get so two, three different flavors, for lack of a better term, of, of adventure. And then we have a few different course areas. Um, you know, we operate through most of the Western United States or Colorado, Utah, Arizona, for the most part. Um, and then we go for some of our courses go to Patagonia, so the ice sand region of Patagonia. Oh. Um, and uh, so those are the that's sort of the structures. So we have three different flavors, and those different different course types go um, to these different course areas. Um, so we're a fairly small gap program. You know, we you know we are we don't run courses all over the world. We don't have a ton of students. We're a relatively small gap program. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best summary from there so far. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think, I, um, you know, the, the, the connection between us and the opportunity for this conversation was made by, uh, by Amy, who was a former, uh, one of our students who did our, our year long program. Um, and then, you know, went on and did essentially another gap year and part of which she spent at, at HMI and, um, and she, you know, uh, in her it was really meaningful to me. It took time, you know, when she was off the trail to to send a message in and keep me posted. And it was really fun to see all the different places that that she was experiencing in the course of that semester. And so, you know, across across the Western United States, as you're saying, different kind of environments and different kinds of activities. So, but it's place based. If the place that you're dealing with is pretty big, yeah, it's pretty big. And and we try not to make it too big. I think that's you know, that's the other piece of this. Um, you know what was i think with our gap program the shift from you know this idea of intellectual engagement and the outdoors what we um that intellectual engagement for our gap program is is very place based and really stewardship and conservation focused mm -hmm. um which similarly i think going back to this idea of the the literature class you know in, you know in in the place where that you know on, on a wilderness trip for example um you know we're taking that in a little little more specificity to think about the land itself. So what's the what's the natural history of that place? What's the human history? Um, whose stories are getting told about this place? Whose stories aren't getting told as well? You know, who are the people that you know have been here that aren't getting the same representation anymore? Um, and then bringing that to so the same kinds of questions to um, you know more contemporary lens of access to the outdoors now. Um, so there's certainly an equity and access uh, thread in our curriculum for our GAP program. And then there's also the conservation, you know, the conservation element of how do we value this land? What are the different perspectives and different values of it? You know, we are in a lot of places that have recreation, you know, uh, value, recreational value, um, resource extraction value, um, cultural value, um, as well as you know, there in a lot of places a preservation value saying let's you know let's not change this. We want to keep this you know wild. And um, so, and, I, and what we hope to achieve with that is to help students think about um, their own values around land and conservation, um, as well as I think recognizing that these are such complicated questions, and um, it was how we. There's, there's, there are not there are complicated questions and no simple answers. Um, there are, it's hard to not have trade-offs when we think about, you know, how, you know, how we exist and what our relationship with the land and with each, with each other is, um, and, and also using these outdoor skills to be able to explore these places and to, you know, to, to build a connection to them. So I think again, we can understand, um, you know, for example, we travel to 
Patagonia National Park in Chile, um, the, the newest national park in Chile, a you know, pretty incredible story of conservation, but it's also quite controversial and quite complicated. Um, and it's one thing to read about, another thing to be hiking through it and understanding the story of this place and, and what's gone into creating uh, this, you know, what I think is most folks would call a pretty, pretty uh, huge victory in the conservation movement. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, are you are you interacting with the you know the local people wherever you are, whether it's in the U.S. or in or in South America? Yeah. So we try to build relationships with land managers. Um, we work with other conservation groups. Like you know, our stu our student groups often will work with local um, stewardship organizations. You know, building trails or doing environmental restoration work. So. They, you know, they're one part is the sort of, you know, more typical outdoor recreation. There's also a bit of a volunteer element where they're, you know, um, uh, you know, in Western Colorado, we work with a, a small, um, it's called the Silt River Preserve. And I mean, another fascinating story, it was slated to be a hotel right on the Colorado River. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the, the business fell through. Like, I, I don't know the details of why the hotel was never built, but basically there's this chunk of land sitting on the Colorado River and the Aspen Valley Land Trust saw this as a huge conservation opportunity, purchased the land, and now they're building it. There's an organic farm, um, there are trails, um, and, and a lot of it's for, you know, to preserve the riparian ecosystem and maintain its integrity. Um, and so our groups get to go work on the farm, do other um, maintenance in the preserve, and it's, and, and, so I think uh, getting to um, both do the work, but also appreciate the recreational opportunities of this place, I think, again, sort of deepens that experience, this connection. You know, I think it, it makes the, it makes the, the ground deeper, um, it, it's richer. Um, and I think their experience, it'd be one thing if they just went rock climbing, and said, oh, that was really cool. Um, but they also they get to go rock climbing and they get to appreciate why like what the context that that, that exists in and what else is going on in there. Yeah, yeah. That there's some things that you can really learn only by being there about about the human culture of a place. So that that's really cool to hear. Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, we're we're this is going to be coming out during Gap Year Exploration Month, and then you know, as a as the founder of, of the Gap Program there, um, you know, what what is your sense about um, about the students who are coming to do these gap programs, so like where are they coming in their story, and and why do they choose to do this? Um, I think as uh, uh, recently spoke with with Carrie McWilliams from the Gap Year Association, and you know, for many people still, and as a high school counselor, like this idea of gap year in the United States is a relatively new one, or at least introduced in the way that 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 structured programs like ours are doing it. Um, like what who 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 does this sort of program, and and what leads them to what are they seeking? Would you say? Mm -hmm. No, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think I guess I'll, I'll, my, my, my disclaimer is that I think that I am impressed with the diversity of of motivations and and you know who does this, how do they learn about it? You know what you know the students that find us um, are coming from all over the place. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, one of the we'll start with here's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> about a student early on in, in HMI Gap, um, a young woman who, I don't know the, all the details, but spent a little bit of time in detention in high school. Mm -hmm. And in detention, she started watching YouTube videos and she found some climbing YouTube videos. <laughs> and she just decided, I want to go do that. And she just got on the internet, found a climbing Gap program. And we were we, we were the lucky ones to be that, right? Um, and uh, so she, it was a pretty random <laughs> way that she found us. Um, it was just some algorithm somewhere on the internet got her to here. And uh, and so, you know, I think that being said, um, you know, there's a, there's a, I think we're all pretty aware of a pretty um, set, there's a template for what our academic journey looks like. Right. And I think to, to make some, slightly broad characterizations i think there's two two folks there's one set of folks who that's not working very well for them that's a struggle and they don't feel like they've found a lot of success um even if they have maybe technically experienced success like you know they're graduating high school um they've they've gotten decent grades um they've shown they understand um but maybe it's been more of a struggle than they than they want it to be um 
And then I think there's also the students that it just feels like it's just not the right fit. You know, the, the shoe just doesn't quite fit right. They have they've made it through, made it quite successful, um, but just want something different and and are not ready to go on that. Um, I think probably those are folks a little bit more like me um, that just really need to be different, um, really need to not take the standard path. Um, you know, and I remember when I was in high school, I think the idea, I think I remember hearing about gap years, but it was, um, yeah, I think there was some stigma around right. what, who that was for. And I think there were some assumptions about, oh, well, you're just not ready for college yet. Um, and I think in my situation, you know, I, I looked around and saw what a privilege getting to go to college was because so many of my peers were not going to college. And so I feel like I had an incredible opportunity. And, and to me, that felt super valuable. Um, I think now, even in, you know, that that was uh, a long time ago, it's <laughs> 20 something years ago now, things have changed. I think college is much more of an assumption for most people, um, it, or, or at least it's a pressure. I don't know if it's assumption, but certainly there's a lot of pressure. Like, oh, everyone goes to college, that's what we do. Um, and I think that's a, a potentially problematic attitude, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that our students, yeah, going back, I think there's some students who like that, that template has just really been a struggle and maybe a, a little bit of a lack of dignity in, in how they've gone through that and, and aren't feeling like they have the success that they want. Um, and then also the students who just, I, I need to do something different. I want a different path. Um, I want something more. Um, in terms of our actual student profiles, you know, we accept students, you know, our kind of criteria is a student has to have finished all their requirements for, for high school. Now we do have some students who graduate early mm -hmm. or who have finished their classwork early and are just waiting till May to get their diploma. Um, and so as long as they have no other um, obligations to finish high school, you know, so we have some 17 year olds or some younger mm -hmm. folks who come. And then we also um, have, we say you can't have finished college or be sort of of college completion age. So we call that usually 22. So we do sometimes have, you know, folks who are sophomores, juniors in college who um, want to do something different. And I think there's, I don't want to use the term burnout. I think it's a little more complicated than burnout, but again, wanting something different. Um, maybe you're transitioning from one college to a different college. Um, and so want to, you know, want to do a, a more immersive non-academic experience along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously we have students, they're, they're really excited about the outdoors. They want to be outside for a right. long period of time. They want to learn about these places. Um, and, and so I think those are sort of, that's sort of the ecosystem of folks that we, that we see at HMI. How many of, this, of the students do you get really don't have that outdoor experience before who are, who are just learning these skills from, from scratch? Um, it'd be hard for me to say percentage wise, but we are, we're very uh, adamant that we're a no experience necessary school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we believe that you can learn to backpack, you can learn to rock climb, you can learn to be a leader. You know, I think we, we, we are very skill oriented and um, you can learn to be a good community member. Um, you know, I, I think that's um, something, again, that I really value. I think I sort of came from a much more entity theory of like, oh, you just some people are born leaders. Yeah. And it's been a really cool journey for myself of learning, like, well, we can actually teach this and we can really help people be versatile leaders, but also be true to themselves and sort of what they feel like is their demeanor, their personality, but still adapt to be an effective leader in a lot of different situations. Similar with the outdoors, um, you know, even even just the sort of tolerance for adversity is a skill that that we can acquire. Um, yeah. So yeah, we have a, a number of students um, that you know their first night in a tent is their first night in HMI. So. And sometimes yeah, those are the most successful ones because they, they have no, right. they, they're a clean slate. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't been messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're anticipating my, my, my next question there, because I mean, I think um, you know, you've got these, these semesters are, are 80 days. And, um, you know, I think we, we, our programs here are, um, you know, we're on trail for, you know, maybe 10 days out of a, of a, you know, a 16 week semester or something like that. Um, but um, you know, the whole thing is a bit of a, is a, is an immersion kind of experience, but uh, I, I, even, even you go out for five days or send off a group for five days and see them come back, the transformation that happens in person, you know, uh, 
in that period is is amazing and also in a group so i wonder you're doing a great job at sharing like great exam you know some specific stories i mean what what do you see what how are these students different after after these uh these expeditionary learning experiences mm -hmm. they um well I mean, I sort of joke with myself, they're a little rougher around the edges, you know, <laughs> their hair's a little longer, a little shaggier. Um, they're maybe just more comfortable being dirty and smelly. Um, you know, they, they get pretty comfortable going pretty long periods of time without showering, things like yeah. that. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I guess maybe what I'm hanging hum, hung up on, but hung up on is a little bit of like what I love about having, uh, you know, what I love about the kind of the gap world in general, and I think you know, this is, includes the work that I do, is that we're so process oriented. We believe in the process that we, our tolerance or our openness to how a student wants to interpret that is pretty high. Yeah. And that is a really wonderful thing to watch. Um, that being said, you know, I think what, what we hear from our students about you know, how they change, what they learn, um, yeah, I, I think uh, there's a, a relationship of like inspiration and curiosity, I think, that we hear from a lot of our alums that um, we're in relationship to learning. Um, just the that you that learning can be curiosity based, it can be inspired by the places we are, it can be inspired by the people we're with, rather than a, a somewhat more top down. This is an interesting or maybe not so interesting thing that we think you need to learn and you're going to now learn it. So, so I think that's a big a theme we hear a lot. Um, I think learning how to work in a team is a big piece of that. Um, watching students, maybe what I'll share too is, you know, we interview all of our students beforehand and, and um, a lot of our students will ask us, what, what's, you know, we'll ask them, what do you think is gonna be so challenging about this? And they're like, oh, I bet the weather's gonna be challenging or I bet it'll be hard to be away from my phone so long. And, and those are all true. But what not that many folks anticipate is how hard the interpersonal dynamics are. Mm -hmm. And that is typically the thing that is the, the, the toughest to navigate. Um, and so I think that the experience of, of you know, I was going back to what I earlier said about, you know, you're, it's this group of 15 people. There's, no, there's, no, there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere to hide. Mm -hmm. um, requires that people um, address conflict differently, Think about how to appreciate people who we maybe don't see eye to eye with, people who aren't our friends, but we're going to build a really strong relationship with. Um, I think that is another huge learning that we hear from students. Um, and you know, I think that that to me that feels like a really important one. You know, I mean, you know, we are on we are all on one expedition, which just happens to be several billion people. You know, there's there's nowhere else to go, and so I do really value <laughs> the. <laughs> you know, it's so important, you know, for us to say, all right, I don't agree with you on this, or I don't get along with you very well, but we need to have a positive relationship to accomplish whatever that mission is. And, uh, and that feels like a, a life lesson I can get behind. So. Yeah, I think that is that that really is is true that in the people don't think about that the social dimension, the interpersonal dimension when they think about these programs, but it is so core. Um, we have in our you know uh, programs here um, these expeditions, but also other aspects of the program are formed and led by people with outward bound experience, and and the, those social technologies, the com communication skills, conflict skills, you know, feedback kind of kind of formats that they bring from that. From, you know, from our bound um, specifically, are just essential to to forming of the the small kind of micro college culture that we're building here. And really, I just it's again, I'm excited to have more people out in the world who who know how to do that, to, to give each other you know feedback and hard moments and uh, and to work with people that they don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I too, I mean, I think the another thing about sort of the gap, the you know, I think, and I guess I'm putting uh, the micro college movement in that category as well. I think, I, I guess I take a lot of um, comfort maybe in knowing in knowing that there's so many people doing comparable kinds of work out there. Because again, like going, you know, I think, I hope that an, any individual student finds the thing that really draws them in. And I'm glad that there are, what, 10,000 different things that could draw them in, right? And, there's, and that there's probably a place that is a small community that can be really supportive, that can 
both welcome them and challenge them. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, I just love that idea. And I think that's a, being part of the gap community is, is really exciting in that way. And, and, and you know, gives me some optimism, just knowing that there, there are, there's such a range of things that still have some of these core values that are similar um, as far as, um, you know, we're, we're trying to help people work together, be, be, you know, be decent humans, be better versions of themselves. Uh, that, that makes me feel good about where we're at as a society. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to, I want to ask you also about rock climbing, um, central to your story, as you shared with us. Um, and there's whole, you know, there's, there's several of, of, of the HMI programs, the different dimensions that are really focused on, on rock climbing. What, what specifically does that, that activity, that field of skill um, contribute to these qualities of development that what what is what does a person learn by doing that that I wouldn't learn from from other types of activity yeah I think rock climbing well I, think I would put rock climbing in a category of there's a lot of uh, activities out there that can kind of fall into this but I mean for me you know in my personal role you know rock climbing is is um is where I practice life um you know it's got it's got social emotional physical dimensions um it has uh or in, in intellectual dimensions you know it's got it's got all of these different different types of challenges types of experiences um it's where i can achieve flow state um mm. it is and so yeah it's how i practice life you know it's like it's how i learn about goal setting it's how i learn about dealing when things don't go as planned dealing with you know, things not going as planned um it's how i learn about emotional regulation and you know i some of my most embarrassing emotional outbursts have been while climbing, which I think is sort of preposterous. Um, <laughs> and so I think that, you know, for me, especially and I started climbing sort of in early adolescence, like by 11 or so. So I've really grown up with this activity. Um, and it, it for me has become the thing that I can use as the um i'm trying to think of the right analogy um you know it's like the sandbox for me for life and i hope that and so i think there's a lot of things out there that could be this for people you know i think sports there's a lot of sports that could be this um i think a lot of mainstream sports sort of suffer from being mainstream in some ways but i you know i certainly don't mean to say that i think that you know a someone who's obsessed with baseball or soccer or something that could have a similar growth through that and i can think it play out in the same ways um and i you know a lot of art i mean i think you know music a lot of these things that sort of uh you know are, are obsession worthy i think can be in this category of, of sort of the, the life practice and so but yeah for me climbing can be that way um and i think from an educational standpoint climbing um, you know, the way we leverage climbing as a, uh, you know, within our programming, um, we, I think fundamentally, you know, climbing is based on a partnership, you know, and, and, and in a very immediate, literal way, your life is in someone else's hands. Yeah, trust is really important. You know, it, you know a radical concept of trust that we do not, um, there's, there's not many other places in life other than maybe driving, which is sort of bizarre, kind of, you know, everyday thing that we're actually... Uh, it's kind of an amazing social contract, but, um, but uh, <laughs> so I think with climbing, there's this partnership element. Um, there is, a, there's, there's sort of an intellectual, there's a physical challenge. Um, there's also the sort of emotional regulation, social challenge. Um, it is a great um, community building with other people, right? You know, I mean, you know, the climbing community is this amazing entry into around the world. You know, I think one of the wonderful things about the sort of the explosion of the outdoor industry is that now most places in the world have climbing communities and it's an incredible gateway into that community that you sort of have a common language, common common theme, that then you can expand on those relationships. Um, and you know, I, I personally and professionally have had that experience of traveling to new places, you know, learning a new language, learning, you know, learning the language of climbing in that place and you know, making friends because we just are happen to be at the same cliff together. Um, and so I think that uh, all of those things add up to being a really um, rich educational canvas. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that, that stood out from what you just said was, was where you were talking about flow state, right? I think that 
one of the things that can happen in education, you know, and maybe it's a great thing to happen, you know, as part of a gap year, right? Some as person is kind of forming their independent adult identity is to find that thing that gets them into that state. And, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. maybe some people find it earlier than that and they're, you know, they're in high school or younger, but, but uh, you know, way to try out something that will, you know, that that is a, a fundamental part of being human in a way is just to to be in that that state some part of your time <laughs> you'll you'll miss it if you don't right and um and so that that that's that's really you know I think it is an important part of uh of an experience like that is to provide opportunities for people to find that thing yeah I mean I certainly wish that I were better at finding it for myself on a regular basis <laughs> like of course you know, it still feels like a little, a little uh, ephemeral for me and I would love to then also be able to teach others to do it um Anything going back to that, it's it's a great process. Like, you know, I think it's a it's an activity that we can say, um, you know, we can we can abstract the benefits of it, but I think intuitively we sort of know something good about this. You know, I mean, you know, no one no one out there is like, oh, you shouldn't play music. That's a waste of you know, it's like playing music, we can all kind of agree it's a good thing to do. And I think climbing has some of the similar qualities for you know, for the right person. You know, some people are no, I <laughs> have no interest in that. Um, but for the right folks, it's, it's, we can sort of say there's an inherent value in that activity. And, you know, we've identified some specific places, specific ways that we leverage educationally. Um, and but I think we can have some trust that this activity has a lot of value. People can draw their own lessons from it, their own learning. Um, and, you know, as long as we're being relatively safe, we want to offer that to folks and facilitate yeah. that. Yeah, it's a wonderful way that these the activities, you know, they, the curriculum writes itself, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I found uh, having taught uh, also in the classroom and taught practical and, you know, outdoors things, you know, there's a way that these, you know, they're, what, what you're going to do uh, and you're on a winter camping trip or you're, you know, you're going down the river is, is pretty clear, right? In a way that, you know, uh, designing a, a classroom activity is, is is pretty different. So that, 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 that you know, a natural flow of inter interactions like flow from that as well yeah i really like that the curriculum writes itself yeah i think that's um that's a more eloquent way i think that you know we sort of we've often said like you know the uh, this doesn't need to um I don't know what I'm trying to think. you know i think within the history of hmi i think we've run there's a bit of a an arc to being very very intentional and, on, and, and maybe even getting more intentional. And, you know, in some ways, I think there's all, there's like sort of the, the, the other side of that arc is saying, actually, like, let's, let's let it play out a little bit more. Um, and I think that's a, that's a delicate place to get to, but it's also, like, I think, very rich. If like, when can you get to a place where saying, here's, we've got the, the, the platform, and now we're going to let folks exist in that and have some trust that that's going to, that's going to be a rich learning for them. Yeah. Well, that's part of the spirit of play, right? Like, you know, Schiller has this idea of, you know, play being the highest state of the human being. Um, and, and these are, you know, these recreational activities, they are, you know, they are, they are, you know, they're forms of play and, and in the highest sense of that. And I, I definitely have, have, um, yeah, I've observed students in the best scenarios get into that play state on, on trail or on the river, wherever it is, like, cause they are, they are able to, and and part of that is is being open to what emerges. What what's around the next bend that wasn't expected? What's what's you know even the problem that's emerging? Oh, we did we forgot the you know the the hatchet or whatever. How do we how do we figure that out? There's a there's a play a play aspect that is um, it's hard to find in in a lot of like structured programs in our in, in our mm -hmm. bureaucratic and kind of uh, institutionalized world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that resonates a lot with with me and with our experience that we. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the, the play, the play part. Um, I think going back to like that's idea of like you know I think about the sandbox um, mm -hmm. analogy is I think that we you know we know with young children right, that the the playground is an incredibly rich place for learning, and you know with some developmental shifts and adaptations for an older audience, I mean why would we assume any different for yeah. older folks? Yeah, again, um, points yeah, to, we want to give a playground. It's just a different playground. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, these some of the students who come to our to your program, I'm sure, and and uh, occasionally to ours as well, who are coming out of more kind of high pressure academic backgrounds in high school or in college, right? This is you know, it's a real breath of fresh air for for them to have that space to 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 play as well. So 
Well, we're coming up towards the end of our, our hour here, Chris. And I wanted to maybe, um, you know, you you get a chance in your work to see some of the most beautiful places in the world, I feel like. Um, I wonder if you could just share a, um, a story or just a, just a description of one of your favorite places to take your program participants and, and be with them. Oh, wow. Let me think about this for a second. <laughs> The, the the sad part is that I don't actually get to be in these places as much anymore. You know, in my you know, the earlier time I got to I got to be out in the field more. And now I sadly, you know, with, with like, you know, it's a better balance with the family, but it's not as inspiring for unlike the places I go. Um, but let me think for a moment about I think that there is, well, this is actually kind of a funny, um, maybe a funny connection, but we have a photo that we use on a lot of our posters and stuff. And it's it's actually of a few of our, the first gap cohort at HMI in 2015. And they are sitting on this gravel beach over um, Lago Verde in Patagonia National Park. Mm. and it's it's this great i mean it's 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 a great marketing photo because you know they're just like a few <laughs> folks sitting looking it's at the backs and then looking out over this lake and I, i'm thinking about that photo because i'm thinking about the actual moment of that and um you know we had it was the first year we had run this program so it was really like a pilot we had no idea you know how things were going to go we had done a bunch of research we built you know we, we you know we had some we'd done our we'd done our homework but you know there's a difference between like the doing your homework and actually doing the thing. And, um, you know, that that trip in in Patagonia had started with one of the like more challenging storms I have been in, in the outdoors for, <laughs> um, or, you know, on day one, it was raining and we kept hiking over the next six days into the mountains and that turned to snow. There was a time when we maybe hiked about a mile through thigh deep slush it was sort of this swamp that was partially filled with snow and uh, I mean just the scale the scale of the landscape and, and what we were doing was pretty wild um and uh then that storm moved on um we thawed out we dried out um and there you know we ended up on this lake it was this beautiful green lake deep in the mountains um and the you know, sun was out and uh you know I think this was pretty late in that first semester. This was probably in late November, sort of around Thanksgiving. Um, and we'd had so many doubts along the way of, wait, what are we doing? Is this, is this, this con you know, is this, is this concept going to work? Is this trip going to work? Um, are our students going to get anything out of this? And um, it was just a, a really wonderful moment of, of not thinking about it in those terms, but being like, yeah, I, I think being in an inspiring place having some faith and again kind of going back that the playground was actually a good playground it was it was a rich place for learning um and just really getting to appreciate being in this inspired you know inspiring landscape um getting to take a, deep, take a deep breath relax you know sort of our own our own gap experience for a moment too you know i think that's one of the fascinating with the other elements of these immersive programs is that we as the facilitators are on this journey with our students too and so for my partner and I and our other the other staff, uh, kind of coming through it as well, you know, being on that journey and sort of seeing the the bigger picture for a moment and letting it be letting it be just a wonderful moment um, felt really good. So I think that's that's in, in you know, folks look at HMI's website, things like that, they might see uh, see this photo, you, you'll you'll know it. There's like you know, it's like four students sort of backs to the camera, like looking out of this beautiful lake and it's pretty pretty great moment. So. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the backstory to that image. Um, yeah, and, and isn't that true that the you know the contrast of the challenge leading up to it up to that moment is is a big part of this this whole this whole type of education and 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 certainly resonates with me the the sense that you know the the people you know the the organizers and and leaders of these get you know it's also a continual path of of self development as well. So certainly something I mm -hmm. appreciate about this work. So. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. And uh, thank you for, yeah, for, for modeling what you're modeling there at HMI. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. You as well. Thank you so much for the time. Mm -hmm.